We believe it's not by accident that you're here. We think it's a divine appointment to not hear music or not even hear a sermon or not to hear scripture read or not just to hear a prayer, but to hear God Almighty speak to you through all those different ways that he's already communicated and that he's going to communicate. The story of Zacchaeus has a special place in my life. Some of you know that uh, brought, I was brought up in church and great godly parents and in church all the time, like some of you may have been. Some of you may be the complete opposite of that, but I was, and uh, probably because of that, made a decision when I was probably six years old and had pretty good church-type behavior for a lot of those years because of my upbringing and things like that. And then just to fast forward, uh, as a single teacher and a coach at age 36, I remember just laying in my bed one night and thinking that I'm just not sure a true follower of Jesus could, be, could live the way I'd been living. Even though, again, it wasn't as bad as a lot of my friends and uh, the world would have said I was a, a pretty decent guy because I still had some behavior modification that put me in the religious crowd. I still went to church. I still gave money. I wasn't as bad as some of my friends. But I remember laying there that night and knowing now that it was just the Holy Spirit conviction on my life. I remember thinking, since, since I'm not sure if a Christian, a true Christian, can live the way I've been living for a bunch of years, not just a single step off the path, but for a period of years, I remember thinking, if I really believe this Bible is true and that heaven is real and that hell is real, then I need to at least get this settled. And so I remember that night just saying, Lord, I don't know what happened at age six, but I know that I want to trust in what you've done, your life and death and resurrection for my salvation. I can't do it enough. And so whether I was saved at six and just gotten off the beaten path or whether I'm doing this now for the first time, really trusting in you for salvation, come into my heart and change me and help me to follow you. And I can remember the next day was radically different just in my thought process and my desires. I started to want the things he wanted and there was transformation taking place, and I just wasn't smart enough to really know what was going on. I remember thinking, Lord, if, if this is salvation at age 36, just tell me. The good news is I know I'm saved, but it matters in baptism. I want to follow you in believer's baptism, so just, just show me. And I never could get clarity on whether I was saved at 6 or 36 because I had enough church in me in that, in that 30 year gap. I, I just, like I said, I was probably in church almost every single week. And, read the Bible some and gave my offerings and all those kind of things. So it was just enough to confuse me on which was my salvation date. And I say all that to say it was actually studying for a sermon as a minister. After God had called me into the ministry and in sitting home studying for a sermon uh, at uh, the church I was at in Mississippi on Zacchaeus, and I started to read and study and pray, and I just saw the transformation in Zacchaeus' life. And I realized that I wasn't saved at six. There wasn't any transformation at all. I was saved at 36. And so the reason that mattered, obviously, for me was in following the Lord in believer's baptism. And so it was an unusual call to my associate pastor to say, hey, I need a little favor from you. He said, what's that? I said, I need you to baptize your pastor tomorrow. And there was some quiet, but then, okay, if that's, that's what you think we need to do, we'll do. So I had to wait till the end of the service because... I knew they probably wouldn't hear anything else if we did it earlier in the middle. And so preached hard on Zacchaeus and life transformation. And after that, I said, your pastor just discovered for sure studying this sermon that I wasn't saved at six. I was saved at 36. So got baptized that particular day. And as I was thinking about Andy saying, finding your rest, Jesus invites you into your rest. I can't tell you how much rest that brought to my soul because Every week, I mean, I was saved. I was going to heaven, but I was standing up preaching hard about the fact that to follow Jesus means all in, total surrender. And, and yet, when I look back at that age gap from 6 to 36, uh, there just wasn't any of that. There was just some going to church. There was some reading the Bible. There was some giving of my offering. But Christ wasn't my king. Uh, baseball was my king. And 
and, and ladies were my king, but Jesus wasn't my king. And so what a freeing thing that was to finally come to grips with the fact that I got saved at age 36. And now, even though I do it imperfectly, I'm a follower of King Jesus. And so Zacchaeus, the story holds a great part in my life and in my heart. Jesus is going to show us a classic example of the kingdom of God coming to an outcast. And really, we're all outcasts. We're all sinners. Zacchaeus may be more obvious than, than some others. Some of you may have been brought up in church like me and have behavior modification. And I sometimes think that's the most difficult person to get saved at times because we look so much like a Christian that it's hard for us to understand that we're a sinner in need of grace. Christopher read the text and we saw it on the screen, but back to Luke 19 verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector, and he was rich. Understand, chief tax collector probably means that he had multiple tax collectors under him. So not only was he extorting money or taking more money than he was supposed to, he had tax collectors under him that were doing the same thing, and he was getting a commission off how much they were stealing. So Zacchaeus was extremely hated, getting money for the enemy-occupying army. The Romans. Verse 3, he was trying to see who Jesus was, but was not able to because of the crowd, since he was a short man. Now, you saw a picture of it in the video, but how hated do you have to be? I mean, if you picture a Christmas parade, if there's a small child, everybody's going to let the child in front or hold the child up to see the Christmas parade or anything like that. That's just common courtesy. And even if you happen not to like the short person or the child, you would do that out of courtesy because it's not hurting you. They're shorter than you. You can still see what's going on. So how much must have they have hated Zacchaeus not to let him in front of them to see Jesus? It wouldn't have hurt them at all, but it was kind of payback for him stealing from them. Verse 4, so running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When I read that verse, I thought about last week where we talked about to become a follower of Jesus, you have to become like a child. You have to have childlike faith. You have to be joyfully dependent on Jesus. And you have to be willing to lower down your pride, lower your guard, and actually just quit being so concerned about what other people think. Be concerned about what he thinks. And so Zacchaeus did that. Men in general back in this day, and especially important men, they wouldn't run. They sure wouldn't climb a tree. Zacchaeus didn't care. He basically went into childlike mode because he wanted to see who Jesus was. Verse 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. Necessary for me to stay at your house. This Really, in the, in the way the language is used, it's not so much a request as it is a mandate. I'm coming to your house. And aren't you glad we serve a God who pursues us that way? I'm coming after you. Some of you may not even realize why you're here today. Some of you guests may have just kind of thought you happened here or thought that you happened to accept somebody's invitation Odds are it's more than that. Odds are it's the king of the universe that's coming after you. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. God so loved the world that he's coming after you. This is a hallelujah moment. It was for Zacchaeus. It, the language actually reminded me in John 4, 4, it said, it's just a tiny little phrase, but thinking about the woman in Samaria, it said that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. Now it's necessary for him to stay at Zacchaeus' house. These are divine appointments, just like some of you have a divine appointment today. Verse 6 of Luke 19. So he quickly came down, and he welcomed him joyfully. You want to talk about a contrast. You see a sinner like Zacchaeus that's being pursued by Jesus. And when the meeting takes place, there's joy in his heart. He's finally connecting with the king, the one who can fill the void in his soul that Zacchaeus has been trying to fill with everything else. The one who filled the void in my soul that I was trying to fill with everything else from age 6 to 36. I was running down the road of 
athletic success or running down the road of other things and no, nothing could fill that but Christ alone. Zacchaeus welcomed him joyfully, but look at the contrast in verse 7. All who saw it begin to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. And how many of us at times can be judgmental like that as well? Well, who is that that's coming to get saved? Or sometimes we'll see maybe on TV that some horrible criminal supposedly got saved. And our first reaction is, well, that's just jailhouse salvation. That must not be really happening. Well, ours is not to judge the heart. Understand that we're all wicked sinners. And when those people were complaining and saying, look at Jesus, he's gone to stay with a sinful man. My question is, well, who else is he going to stay with? That's the only option he's got. We're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So even the Pharisees, who we've mentioned in the last few weeks, who on the outside looked so prim and proper, knew how to dress for church. They knew how to recite scripture in church. They knew how to say long flowing prayers. They were not only equally as sinful based on the response of Jesus, they were probably more sinful than Zacchaeus who had been stealing money from people. When they were complaining because Jesus went to be with sinners, it reminded me of Mark 2, 17. It said, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they're sinners. That's who Jesus is after this morning too, by the way. If you think you're good enough apart from him, you're not worthy of him. You will not receive him in a proper biblical fashion if you think that you're pretty good, if you think that you're going to depend on your own righteousness when you get to heaven. In fact, most people we talk to when we're sharing our faith, at least in the American culture, most all of them, if you say, why do you think God's going to let you into heaven? Almost every single one will say, well, because my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. You know, they're hoping the score is 100 to 99, that they barely just eke in, that they've done a few more good things than they have bad things. Or maybe if they're really righteous, they'll say, well, I've only done a couple of bad things and I've done a bunch of good things, so I'm going to be okay. The problem is that's not the way it works. Jesus, in fact, said, I didn't, I didn't come to call those who think they're righteous enough on their own. I came to call those who know they're a sinner, who know they've fallen short of the glory of God. And biblically speaking, that would be all of us. And I've given you the example many times before, but that mentality of saying that I hope my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, that doesn't even work in a human court of law. You're not going to be able to rob that bank and go before a judge and say, yeah, I know I robbed it, but I've been a pretty good guy other than that. My good deeds, I come to church, I give money, I work in the soup kitchen, I've done a lot of good things, I just happen to rob that bank, so you need to let me go, judge. He's going to say, yeah, I'm going to let you go to jail. That's what you've done. Even if it's the only crime you've ever committed, you committed a crime, you're going to jail. And so how we think we're going to stand before the holy God of the universe and say, I hope my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, that doesn't work. It takes perfection to stand before the holy God of the universe and to spend eternity with him. And the good news is there's been one who is perfect, and that's Jesus. Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect life that we couldn't live. And then he died on the cross, paying for our sins. The perfect, spotless Lamb of God died on the cross, taking God's wrath but then when he died, he rose again in power, defeating sin, death, and hell in the grave. And as he rose again in power, now any of us who will admit our need for his righteousness, we actually, once we trust in what he's done, we get credited with his righteousness. So when we stand before a holy God, he's not looking at my miserable, sinful life. I get credited with the perfect life of Jesus once I trust in him. Because Jesus took my sin on the cross you say, well, that doesn't sound like a very fair swap. It's not fair. It's just from a loving God. It's called mercy. It's called grace. God gave his mercy and grace to me when I trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I get credit for his righteousness. And so when I stand on that solid rock, I get to spend forever and ever and ever with him. Verse 8 of Luke 19. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look. 
I'll give half my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I've extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Now, Zacchaeus here is going way beyond the Old Testament rules of what he needed to do. Most of the Old Testament rules usually said pay back twice as much. The only things that dealt with four times as much were like if somebody stole an animal and the animal died or if they ate the animal, then in that particular case, they had to give back four times as much. But in general, if you stole or whatever, you gave back twice as much. And so Zacchaeus is, and, and by the way, even, even the giving to the poor, you were considered super spiritual back in that day if you gave 20% to the poor. And so Zacchaeus is just basically what he's saying is, man, I've been changed. This, this money that used to mean so much to me doesn't mean anything anymore. I'm just going to start giving stuff away and living with open hands. And I'm not worried about paying back two times as much. Just if there's any doubt about this, just give them four times as much. This money, this stuff means nothing to me anymore. Isn't that radically different than one chapter earlier when we talked about the rich man who Jesus loved him enough to say, hey, you got an idol of money. Let's get rid of that idol of money and just come follow me. Remember, Jesus told the rich man, because basically because idols your money, money is your idol, just give it all away and come and follow me. And it says the rich man went away sad because he wasn't going to do it. He was clinging to his money. And so my question to you this morning is, what's, what's keeping you from following King Jesus? What's keeping you from becoming like a child and having childlike faith? What if Zacchaeus would have just remained prim and proper and stood behind the people and never seen Jesus? But instead of that, he lowered his pride and ran. And he lowered his pride and he climbed a tree. What about you? Are you, maybe you've been here for weeks and you said, I know I need to come to talk to somebody about following Jesus, but what will people think? I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a, I'm a deacon. I'm a, I'm a staff member. What would they think if I came and said, I need to get saved? Well, number one, what does it matter what they think? Amen. It matters a whole lot what he thinks. And if this is any kind of a decent church, they'll rejoice with you when you come to Christ. But even if they didn't, it's all about him anyway. It's not about a church. It's not about other people. It's about King Jesus. So I'm encouraging you today, lower your pride like Zacchaeus. Do what it takes. Do whatever it takes. Don't play games with your eternity. Eternity is a mighty long time to care about what somebody else thinks. There's probably students and adults all over this place that just will not red face come to Jesus well think about what Jesus did for you do you think he enjoyed the mocking and the beating and the crown of thorns and the abuse he did it for you because he loves you he left the splendor of heaven to come down here humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross that's part of childlike faith to be a Christian is humbling yourself many times in front of people Jesus said if you acknowledge me on this earth I'll acknowledge you in heaven but if you deny me on this earth, I'll deny you in heaven. Are you willing to humble yourself like Zacchaeus did? We need, we need a, a time out in the sense here of make sure you understand that Zacchaeus giving half of his stuff to the poor and Zacchaeus paying back four times what he had stolen, make sure you realize that's not what saved him. Your works cannot save you. There are people, again, all over, especially our country, that just, they're coming to church to try to please God. They're putting guilt offerings in the offering plate to try to please God. They're dressing a certain way. All these things trying to earn his favor. It's nothing we can do. It's only what he's done. And so Zacchaeus wasn't doing these works to get saved. He had gotten saved. And so these works just started to happen. Probably our go-to verse on making sure we understand that you can't get saved by works is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You're saved by grace through faith. By the way, that's a great picture of Zacchaeus. The grace of God, the grace of Jesus, undeserved, came to him. Zacchaeus had faith in Jesus. This is not from yourselves. It's God's gift. Not from works so that no one could boast. By the way, that's just our human nature. If there was something we could do to get saved, we would brag about it for the rest of our days. I came to church. I got perfect attendance in church. I won the Bible drills in church. 
I know all these things. That doesn't save us. Trusting only in what he's done. That's what saved us, not our works, so that we won't boast. So Zacchaeus' works didn't save him. But understand again, once you get saved, you will have good works. Nobody ever quotes the next part of Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says you're saved by grace through faith, not works. Ephesians 2, 10 says this. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So Zacchaeus giving away his money, Zacchaeus restoring and reconciling himself to other people, helping his horizontal relationships by giving back four times what he had stolen. Those were some of the good works God prepared beforehand for him to do because he had been saved by grace through faith. Not a result of works. Zacchaeus giving away all that money didn't save him, but it certainly can be a good role model to us about what experiencing the extravagant grace of God, and it is extravagant. It's lavish. It's, there's, there's not enough words to describe what Jesus has done for us. And so once Zacchaeus experienced that extravagant grace, then all of a sudden, he demonstrated extravagant generosity. And so all of us need to look at our own life in that regard as well. And I'm not talking about offerings. I'm talking about the way you live life. Do you live life with open hands? And that includes not just with your money, but with your, with your time, with your affections, with your passions. Are they going toward King Jesus in a way that shows itself horizontally? Do you love other people well? Are you willing to give up time for other people? Are you willing to be a servant? Are you willing, Jesus was a foot washing leader. Are you willing to be like that with other people? Zacchaeus demonstrated that extravagant generosity. It, it freed him up. The grace he experienced freed him up to live in a different way, trusting in God for his provision. Zacchaeus may have been giving up some of his stolen retirement that he'd gotten from other people, but either way, it was something that he would normally depend on. He didn't have to worry about that anymore. He trusts in King Jesus. He trusts in his provision. And life looks totally different when you trust in him instead of trusting in us and trusting in our brain power and trusting in our own schemes. Zacchaeus, a great model of living out trust and dependence on King Jesus. Do we look different once we've been transformed like Zacchaeus? Galatians 5, and 23 describes it this way. The fruit of the Spirit, in other words, the fruit of being saved, what it's going to look like is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I certainly don't demonstrate that perfectly, but that's, that's in me. The Holy Spirit in me is desiring to produce that fruit. And as you've heard us say before, we don't get to pick and choose. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit where I can just say, okay, I've got a little love, but it's okay that I don't have patience because my family has never had patience. It's okay that I don't have joy. My family's never had joy. That's not what it says. It says if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to demonstrate all these things. And again, it grows over time. But have you been transformed from the inside out? If you have been, we need to be demonstrating these things. If you haven't been, it doesn't matter how many times you pray to prayer or been baptized or joined a church. If you're not demonstrating these, this fruit of the Spirit, you don't have the Spirit in you. If it's in you, it's going to be manifested in some way. John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. If you love one another, are you loving people, even the unlovable? Beth gets a great chance at that every day. And some of you may say, me too, I, I elbow in your spouse. Are you loving the unlovable? The lost people can love the lovable. How are you doing with those that aren't so lovable? Are you able to have the, the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ when it comes to those things? Jesus said, that's how people are going to know that you follow me. It's how you love one another. I saw a quote this week from the Gospel Coalition that said, Christianity, in other words, following Christ, is something that your unbelieving neighbor should at least want to be true. So if you're saying you're a Christian, 
They need to be able to look at you and how you treat people. Do you serve people? Do you help them when they need helping? Do you bring them food when they need to be brought food? Do you pray for them when they have a concern in their life? Even if they don't yet believe in Christ, would they say, man, that, those people are just different. I wish the whole world would love like that and forgive like that and serve like that. I'm not sure yet if this is true, but I hope it is because there's something going on there. Or are we no different than anybody else? Do we demand our rights at work? Do we demand our rights in the neighborhood? This is all about me. Don't you mess with me. I'm going to demand my rights. We need to understand, believers, dead men don't have rights. And so it's all about him. It's all about what he wants. It's all about his mission. Do people at least hope that Christianity is true based on what they see in your life and in my life? Verse 9 of Luke 19 Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Jesus told him, because he too, talking about Zacchaeus, he's a son of Abraham. And it might be tempted there to say, well, yeah, he's a son of Abraham. He's a Jew. That's why the Jews hated him. He was a Jew taking up taxes for the Romans. Oh, Jesus wasn't talking about the fact he was a Jew. He was a Jew before he met Jesus. You're an American before you met Jesus. And, and it's hard to believe. There are some people in our country that think because they wave the red, white, and blue, they get to go to heaven too. Well, the Jews don't even get to go to heaven because they're a Jew. Americans certainly don't get to go to heaven because they're an American. You go to heaven because you trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. No matter what your nationality, no matter what your gender, no matter what your income, no matter what your race is, we're all equal in the sense that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we're all equal in the sense that if we'll trust in the finished work of Christ, we can spend eternity with him. Paul made it clear that being a son of Abraham was not just a matter of your nationality. In Galatians 3 verse 7, he said, You know then, those that have faith, obviously faith in the finished work of Christ, these are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. There it is again, faith in the finished work of Christ. And basically he said it proclaimed the gospel ahead of time to Abraham, saying that all nations will be blessed through you. Now if we weren't sure back when we saw this in Genesis what that meant, Paul's clarifying it for us. When God told Abraham all the nations of the world will be blessed through you, this just tells us that he heard the gospel. He heard the good news that God was going to send a deliverer. God's going to send a rescuer. This just wasn't like, Abraham, you're an awesome guy. The fact you're going to have some kids in your old age, everybody's going to be blessed through you. No, this is much more than that. He heard the gospel. Hey, sinful mankind, God's got a plan. He's got a rescue plan. It involves a Messiah. It involves a deliverer. That Messiah is going to come through you at some point in time. And guess what? Because Jesus is coming through your line, all the nations are going to be blessed through you. Abraham heard the gospel. That's an amazing thing. So verse 9, consequently, those who have faith are blessed with Abraham, who also had faith. Abraham had faith in the Messiah to come. He had faith in the promises of God. We're on this side of the cross, this side of the resurrection. So again, very crucial day to understand. What do you have faith in? All those years from 6 to 36, I had faith in my decision. I had faith in praying a prayer at Central Baptist Church, Decatur, Alabama, when I was six years old. I had faith in that. I had faith back in those days, a pastor would proclaim you saved, just like he was a pope or something. Said a prayer, thou art saved, because he was the King James, so thou art saved. Well, thou weren't saved, whether I said a prayer or not whether I could recite Bible verses better than the other kids or not, whether I got baptized or not, whether I joined that church or not. I was following the program. I wasn't following King Jesus. And so at age 36, when I followed King Jesus and trusted in his finished work, that's when I got saved. That's when the transformation started taking place. So I'm here to tell you this morning, for Jesus, and by the way, he's the one that proclaimed you saved. It's not your mom or your dad or your grandparents or a church or a pastor or anybody else. It's your relationship with King Jesus. It's trusting in his finished work. If you're trusting in anything else besides that, 
You've been running down the wrong lane. You've been heading in the wrong direction. You're still on the broad road that leads to destruction. You're part of a broken world, and people are trying every which way to cure that brokenness. They're trying, many of them are trying things like sex and money and careers and family. And then there's a few people that are trying to get rid of their brokenness by trying religion, even the Christian religion. They're trying to be good enough, trying to jump through enough hoops. And just understand that none of those things cure your brokenness. And many in our churches have tried to cure it that way. What cures your brokenness is handing it to Jesus on the cross and letting him out of love and mercy and grace give you his righteousness. That's what can happen today. That's the transaction that can happen today. It happened to Zacchaeus. It can happen to you. Oh, what would happen in all of our churches around this country if people who had been trusting in their own works, trusting in their own religion, trusting in their decision, trusting in their prayer, what if all those people lowered their pride and became like a little child and just came forward and said, I need Jesus. I don't need all this other stuff. I don't need all the religious trappings. I need Jesus. I need to trust in his finished work. I believe that would usher in revival. We talk about revival and spiritual awakening. A bunch of people in our churches getting saved, that would usher in revival. Then it would become very clear to a lost and dying world that, uh uh-oh, something's different. I've been wondering about those people who live just like I do on Monday through Saturday and then come to church on Sunday, but now there's something different. You don't think the people that knew Zacchaeus didn't see some sort of change? This guy who had been stealing their money now was just loving people and giving stuff away? He had been transformed from the inside out. So what's going to be your answer to Jesus today when he calls you to get rid of all the junk and just follow him in childlike faith? Zacchaeus said, yes, Lord. We don't know all that went on in the conversation, but we know the end result. We could look and see that Zacchaeus had been changed. What's your answer to him? Jesus finished in verse 10 by saying this, something very encouraging, I hope, to you this morning. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost This is almost a preview to where we're going next week where we talk about the prodigal son, the one who was lost, the one who came to his senses and said, "Uh uh-oh, I need to run back to a loving father. There's some people here today that need to understand there's a loving father, the God of the universe who loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus. And he's just been waiting on you to realize that you're, you're running down the wrong road. And the prodigal came to his senses and ran back to a loving father who was waiting on him. He's waiting on you today. What's your answer? Will you come to Jesus? Let's go to him in prayer. God, we love you so much. I thank you that because of your mercy and grace, you waited on me when I didn't even know I was lost. You came to seek and save me when I didn't even know I was lost. God, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your mercy and love and grace. And God, just by the very nature that You've given life and breath to the people here this morning. That means they have a chance. They have a chance to respond to you. They have a chance to lower their pride, to lower their dependence on themselves, their dependence on wealth, their dependence on career, their dependence on brains, their dependence on religion. They have a chance to just throw all that aside and say, no, I want to depend on what Jesus did. Nothing I can do, only what Jesus has done. God, please. Stir people's hearts and affections toward you today. Open their eyes and help them to see that it's Christ and Christ alone who can save. God, again, I thank you for doing that in my life. And I'm begging you today. I'm I'm just imploring you. Holy Spirit, move. Convict people of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then show them there's a loving Father waiting. He's just waiting on them to come and say, yes, Lord. Do this even now, please, God. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.